tell you what they are. The first one, um, well, I'll tell you, yeah, the first one is modern heresies. Okay, that's the first topic that we're going to cover a bit of. Um, the second, and I'd say this is the largely the focus of the sermon, and that's critical race theory in the Bible. Uh, Matthew 18 and our understanding of children is another topic, and so I'm going to camp out on Matthew chapter 18, um, verses 1 through 6, as it relates to power dynamics. Okay? So hence, critical race theory. Um, and then the other topic, I think this was, I think this was given to me also by Rick, um, what does it mean for Christians to live in a messed up world? So that's, uh, those are the things that we're going to cover. Um, it may be that in, in sermons later on down the line we dig a little deeper into them, uh, but really this is melding together all of these and starting with and, um, God's Word. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Matthew 18, 1 through 6. Listen to this. This is the Word of God. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to Him a child, He put Him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So forget about who's the greatest in the kingdom. You won't even enter into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that um, your wo word would be clear today, that it is your word that we stand upon. Lord, that our hearts would be uh, transformed and shaped and, and uh, molded by your word, by your truth that you have given to us. Give us wisdom. Give us the ability to de be discerning and to assess the things that the world lays before us as we seek to follow you and to be enriched by your goodness. Give us your spirit. In your name we pray, amen. So one of the things that I would say is central to being human in a broken world, whether we are Christian, whether we are Muslim, atheist, Hindu, Baha'i, whatever worldview or faith is held, we share some, to some extent a desire to get along in this world. And by get along, I'm not necessarily meaning get along with each other, although that's part of it, but rather as a people, as an individual, as an institution, as a community, just how to get through with as little suffering as possible to try to endure this world and be happy more than we're sad. And there's theories, what we call the soft sciences, there's studies, the soft sciences that are designed or have been born out of that desire. How do we understand this world and how can we understand it in a way that would make it better to fix what isn't working right? So sociology, which was my major in school, philosophy, psychology, anthropology, are several of those sciences designed to help us improve upon this world. One word, if I were to give it one word, one focus of all these uh, soft sciences is justice. How to discover what is wrong and make it right. And by right we mean what makes our lives happier, better, and with as little suffering as possible. 
and the Bible has something to say about justice. Tim Keller, in, uh, he, in his writing, one of the articles that I read on justice by Tim Keller said, there is biblical justice because we have a God who takes justice seriously. The problem though is that Christians, the church as a whole, tends to be very ignorant of what that looks like. What does it look like for there to be justice in a biblical way that God intended? And they're okay with that ignorance. Justice is a problem for the world to solve. Our focus is on other things. Or B, that was A, B is to do something to be concerned as Christians, to be involved, and that often will mean adopting a secular worldview or a secular perspective on how to attain justice. And usually, if it's not enriched or built off of and adjusted by and guided by the Bible, it tends to go in a direction that is opposed to God's Word or what is more dangerous, something that is vaguely connected to Scripture, such as several examples, liberation theology, the social gospel, health and wealth, faith movement, and critical theory, of which critical race theory is a branch. And yes, critical theory has influence as all theories that the world produces in the church. What is our response? How do we address it? How do we think about it? Several, four categories of how to understand and pursue justice um, are given. There's many more, but these are the four broad, broad categories, approaches to justice in the world. One is libertarian, in other words, and that means the pursuit of justice through individual freedom. Individual freedom is at the very central uh, motivation. Liberal is the next one, and that's the pursuit for justice based on fairness and equality. Fairness is the center focus and desire. Utilitarian, where happiness uh, is at the center, or maybe specifically, um, Finding what works. If this works, if it makes the most amount of people happy and sustains them, then that's the best way towards justice. And then the last one, the more, more, more recent, is postmodern. And that is where understanding and adjusting power dynamics, dialing the dials of power dynamics in order to find the perfect balance that works for our world. That is the one which critical theory comes from. It's the balance of power. All social constructs are determined by a group that is considered dominant or great, and I'm going to use that word, great. The greater group determines how the social structures work and usually and always, they would, they would, many would say, in a way that sustains the status quo, that benefits the greater group. The term critical theory, so just so we have some basis, now there are all kind of definitions out there for critical theory, but so we're on the same page. The term critical theory was first coined by Max Horkheimer in an article that he wrote in 1937 called Traditional and Critical Theory. This is in the Frankfurt School of Germany. And Horkheimer described a theory as critical insofar as it seeks, quote, to liberate human beings from circumstances that enslave them. Critical theory seeks emancipation for human beings and actively works to change society in accordance with human needs. It identifies this is outside of the quote, it identifies an oppressed and an oppressor. And critical theory says, what needs to change? How do we liberate the oppressed from the oppressor? Who is the oppressed and who is the oppressor? And motivates social activism towards that. 
Power oftentimes, especially now, is exercised, according to them, by language and dialogue and influence in the social structure, such as politics and economics. And power is subverted, if not violently or actively, through public silencing, what we would say today is canceling, being canceled. Evil is a result or pathology, crime, etc., is a result of social injustices because of unbalanced power dynamics. That is critical theory, a broad summary. We'll dig into it a little bit more, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page as we assess this, as we think about it biblically. Critical race theory is a branch, a, a child, if you will, of critical theory. Okay? Critical race theory is, those, is the same thing I just said, but it focuses on power dynamics as determined by race. Let me give you an illustration, a hypothetical, I would say maybe a partially hypothetical illustration that would relate to church. And it's called CCMT, Critical Church Music Theory. In any particular church, you will have people who are historicists, hymnologists. They appreciate hymns written, any songs written, usually more than 50 years, anywhere from 50 to 2,000 years ago. Then you have those who appreciate songs that are written more recently, like in the last few weeks. <laughs> They're the contemporary group. We'll call them the contempts. Now, in any particular church, let's just say, for example, a church where the majority, the dominant, the great group are the contempts, those who like and appreciate contemporary music. And they're mean and oppressive and condescending. And they do not allow hymns in the church. They even have a sign on the door, no hymns allowed. And the hymnologists, the historicists are hurt and feel sidelined and mistreated. But then some pastors come along and they're great and godly, wise, biblical pastors. And they see the anger and the tension and the mistreatment. And they say, we got to put a stop to this. So we're going to create a system that helps us to be more charitable to each other and more fair. And they assign a worship committee. And these pastors by admission, are contempts. They like contemporary music, but they're not against hymns. So they form a committee, and this committee of people happens to be more favorable to contemporary music. And so they develop some rules, and the rule one is this, only the committee can pick music that the church sings. And the music must be favorable to the majority of people in the church. Well, that sounds fair. Seems fair. The great group thinks it's fair. And it has to be a song that has been written in the last 25 years. And we will sing hymns, but they have to be mashups with a modern chorus. Well, the historicists, while not being mistreated hatefully, signs taken down, they still feel isolated, ignored, and misunderstood, and canceled. But they're in charge of the children's ministry. And in the Sunday school class, they implement a program for teaching kids about the church fathers, including famous hymn writers. And they teach children how to read music. Well, the contempt, seeing their subterfuge, are outraged. And they ban these teachings. That's the scenario. The question is, what do you do about it? 
What does the pastor do? What does the leadership do? How do they understand CCMT as it relates to church unity? There are power dynamics that are involved. There are oppressed and oppressors. How do we understand? How do we move forward in valuing all people as created by God? That is the situation for us as Christians, similar. The analogy breaks down, of course. How do we as Christians move forward with theories and dynamics in our world that are broken? The option is just to dismiss them and say that's just dumb and, 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 and what has Rome to do with the church, as one of the fathers said? What has the world to do with the church? Or we can have wisdom to assess what the world presents to us and to engage with it thoughtfully and biblically with the desire of being like the child instead of the disciples. So I would first start with this idea that the Bible has for us that in all things as we interact with the world and the theories that are presented to us that have been part of our history and that will always be part of our history as a church in a broken world and that is we need wisdom we need wisdom and not wisdom of the world but wisdom that is from God and I'll ask you brothers and sisters where does wisdom begin? Where does wisdom begin? The fear of the Lord. That's where wisdom starts. We start with a position of humility, of, of saying, God's the boss, God knows. God is the one who gives us the wisdom that we need. And we start with a humble recognition that we are powerless. All of us are powerless. But we have a God who has given us a king and we submit to him. We start like the child in Matthew 18. Not with a position of trying to determine who's the greatest, but with a position of saying, he's the greatest. And we are recipients of his grace. That's where wisdom begins. In Matthew chapter 18, so I want to spend a few minutes now talking about what is biblical what is biblical in our assessment of critical theory and critical race theory? Matthew chapter 18, if you remember that I just read, they were arguing about who is the greatest and he brings a child into their midst. And at that time period, children were thought of a little bit differently than the way children are now, right? Children now are, are beloved and cherished and children have a voice and a presence. And uh, they're to be seen and heard. And that's good. Oftentimes, maybe even over the board where child, children can be given even a greater voice than the voice of an adult. That's today. Back then, it was not so. Children were seen and not heard and oftentimes not even seen. Children were an, a, a necessary annoyance. And that's in the Roman and in the Jewish culture. In the Jewish culture, not because it was biblical, but because... Practically, that's how often things were. They were seen as being uh, a, a, a frustration and they were to be not taken seriously. They were to be taught appropriately, whatever that meant at that time. And, uh, and hopefully they might survive to adulthood. Children, uh, were, it was, children died much more then than now. And so parents, there was, there was a a le less attachment between parents and children. So children were not allowed oftentimes in the presence of adults, especially men. And here is God, Jesus, saying to his disciples who are arguing about who's the greatest, brought a child into their midst. And he said, that is what you need to be like, even to get into the kingdom of God, to be like a child, to be powerless in our society as if one who is dismissed by your own recommendation to be humble and he even uses the word humble to be humble 
And then he goes on and says, you receive them to receive a child into your midst. And that word actually suggests to bring in, to care for, to protect, to provide, to bring them into your, into your presence, into your heart, into your life. This is biblical. This is good. And this needs to be our attitude towards those in our community, those in our society who are marginalized or would be considered less than for whatever reason, whether it's race or class or gender. The Bible says very clearly partiality is evil, partiality is sin. Leviticus 19 verses 15 says it is in exercising justice do not show partiality to the poor or the great. Partiality is bad. And yet we are called in the Bible also to have special concern for those who are powerless. For those who are poor or weak handicapped this is not a contradiction we should show partiality in our judgments to truth or should not show partiality to judgment in our truth in our in our judgments but we are to show special care and that's not partiality to those who would be considered powerless Isaiah 117 Psalm 41 1 are examples of the call to care for those who are needy. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, the book of wisdom says this, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. In the Old Testament, there were laws that were meant to care for those who are weak, who are outside, who are marginalized, who are in need. One example was the law of gleaning wheat. A farmer was commanded to leave the wheat on the edges of the, of, the, of the field along the road ungleaned. Why? So that the poor or the stranger who was traveling along the road could gather wheat for themselves for free. Laws such as this were designed by God to care for those. They were embedded into the system to care for those who are powerless or weak or poor. At the same time, God intends that there would be walls brought down among those that were designed by humans. So for example, Ephesians 2, you've heard it before, where Christ came to tear down the walls between the Jew and the Gentile, the slave and the free, male and female, to tear down those walls to create one people for himself in the church. We are called to pursue justice. That's not an option. It's not a nice idea. It's a command. It's part of what it means to be Christian in our world. To pursue justice. Especially as it relates to those who are marginalized, who are powerless, who are childlike, easily dismissed, and silenced. All people created in God's image need justice. Justice that begins with humility. Justice that begins with the realization that we're all sinners in need of God's grace. What does that look like? What does humble pursuit of justice look like? One example, here's what it could look like. An old man sitting in an office surrounded by boring law books. I have a friend, a young man that I play soccer with, who came from, with his family when he was a boy from Africa, Muslim country, and his family Muslim came to the United States, grew up here, got his driver's license, and then at some point early on was in an accident, not his fault. 
but he didn't know how to deal with the intricacies of American legal system or insurance. And the next thing he knew is he was being charged or he was being uh, given the bill to pay for the accident. He lost his driver's license and somehow stumbled upon the man in the office surrounded by boring law books. And that man said, I can help with that. I know something about this. And he did. And he cared for this young man. And he cared for him by giving time and of his experience. And that man, as you might know, is Al Johnson. When he could have retired after many, many years in the legal profession, he could have retired, taken the easy life. But because he believed what the Bible teaches about justice for the oppressed, he started a ministry called New Covenant Legal Services, specifically designed to serve people like my friend from Africa, to care for them, to stand up for truth, that's an example. There are many examples. And so I encourage us to consider as we live in this world, what does it mean for us to use our voice, whether we are white, black, brown, male, female, teacher, lawyer, doctor, construction worker, whatever it is you do, how do you use the resources that you have to bring about justice for those who need it? The world is full of those who need it. What does it mean to be like a child, not pursuing greatness, but pursuing humility and service to those around us? That is biblical. And those elements are part of what drives critical theory. It's not the whole of it. So then that brings the question, because we seek to be wise, what is not biblical? What is not biblical about critical theory and critical race theory. Well, at the beginning, the question that led to Jesus bringing a child in their midst was, who is the greatest? And they weren't talking about some random group of people out there that might be great or not great, right? They were wanting to know for selfish reasons. They wanted to know which of them were, could possibly be of the great category in heaven, maybe one of them would be the greatest. Or at least it might give them some ideas of how to attain the greatest position <coughs> in heaven. And the word great there means, and actually is, the word mega. And it means to be big, to be influential, to be powerful, to be numerous. <coughs> and they were asking that question. And I would suggest to you that many of us as individuals, but also as uh, part of systems and groups, whether they be political or race or gender, we're also asking that question. We are propel propelled or motivated by that question. Whether we say it outright, it's what's at the heart of it. What does it mean and how do I get to be in the great category? Critical theory and critical race theory are addressing the same questions of greatness, power dynamics. The interesting thing is, and this is where it gets tricky because we have a tricky enemy, is that greatness or power is determined by how little you have. It's a race, if you will, to the bottom. Because those at the bottom have the moral high ground. And there's something that is biblical, but it is a twisting of that biblical. Because that is what Jesus calls to, right? The first shall be last. Those who are great must be humble. And that sounds good. But if you use that merely as a method to only attain greatness, then you've missed the whole point. You've taken what is true and you've twisted it. And it's easy and it's dangerous for us as a church, for the evangelical church of the United States to buy into that twisting. We are oppressed. Evangelicals, we are oppressed. We're great 
we're better. That's the byline. That's behind the scenes. Why? Because we've been canceled and silenced. Look at us. We've been canceled and silenced. We have the moral high ground because of that. Be careful. Be wise. Be thoughtful that we don't secretly buy into the very theory that we might stand against. Three ways that we need to be mindful of theories in general, but critical theory and critical race theory in particular. One, critical race theory, critical theory, fails to identify the true core of humanity. It places undue emphasis on human identity based on superficial categories, race, class, gender. Not that it's wrong to note those things and to value those things, to, di to value diversity and creativity and the differences in our world and to understand and see and identify the differences in class and gender but to put undue emphasis on those identities misses the greater picture that God intends for all of us that we are all created in God's image. That is the unifying characteristic. We carry God's image. Black, white, brown, slave or free, male or female, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor. That is the starting place for understanding power dynamics. We all carry the icon, to use the Greek word, of God. The image of God. Second, critical theory fails to identify the true problem. In critical theory, the source and definition of evil is a power dynamic. It has to do with the oppressed and the oppressor. Whoever holds the power is evil. Whoever doesn't hold the power is good. The problem with that is it's too small. It's too simplistic. One author, Mary Matsuda, law professor at the University of Hawaii, one of the early developers of critical race theory said this, the problem is not bad people. The problem is a system that produces bad outcomes. So things like racism, and that's her quote, this is my interpretation, racism, trafficking, humans, theft, murder, etc., are all problems to be solved systemically rather than a sin for individuals to repent of. Now, it is true that systems promulgate problems and that we can use systems and we should, to help alleviate problems. <coughs> but it misses the true problem. It treats evil as if it were the core and not the symptom of the true problem. The true problem on two categories. One is that we all have sin. We all as individuals are broken, sinful people bent to do what protects ourselves and our happiness. So collectively, a bunch of sinners make a broken system. The second is that we have an evil one. We have an enemy who is scheming and powerful and has the ability to move and adjust human hearts to his will or influence as well as systems. That is the true heart of the problem in our society. We are sinners. We are evil. We are more about ourselves than we are about loving God and loving others. Critical race theory and critical theory focus on unequal power dynamics based on, in, on numerous social issues. But the Bible suggests and screams we are all sinners needing God's grace. We are all sinful at heart 
in need of a merciful God. The theories that we create as humans largely ignore the human heart. Sin and its influence broadly are from Scripture, but also we can see sin and its influence on each of the aspects of human society. In economics, personal greed, or poor work ethic. In politics, the lack of servant leadership, self-promotion. In education, ignoring truth, or in failing to tell true truth. In history and science. In immigration, not practicing hospitality. All these are ways that we see sin impacting our society. Third, the third failure of critical theory and critical race theory is failure to identify the true solution. So it's a failure to identify true core of humanity, failure to identify the true problem, and failure to identify the true solution. I was reading a book recently on the Middle East and called Black Flags, The Rise of ISIS. And it got so confusing trying to explain the dynamics of the Middle East, the, the, the power dynamics and the conflict in the Middle East became so confusing to me that I decided to go online and say, maybe there's a diagram, I'm a visual learner, that it would help me give some understanding of what's going on in the Middle East. And I found this one, if you could pop it up there, Gideon. And the reason I say that is because I believe, at heart, I believe that critical theory as played out in our society, as played out if we were to embrace it fully as a culture, this is what it would lead to. It would be still the question of who's the greatest and it would become fractured between multiple groups all arguing and acting for liberation and for power and fighting among themselves and fighting among ourselves. And the Christian church would be yet another one of these lists if we buy into that, that pursuit of greatness by pleading that we are the one oppressed and we have the higher ground and acting on that. And I think we're seeing that in some ways already among those who call themselves evangelicals. It's just another power grab. But rather the church is called to be something completely radically different. They, call, they fail to identify the true solution. The solution is not to overthrow the governing power. Rather it's to be childlike. It's a call to personal responsibility. A call to make God our King through Jesus. To take a look in our own hearts and identify our own hunger for, act, for, for greatness and to repent of it. And pray that God would have, give us a heart that turns the other cheek, that loves our enemy. And I'll conclude with the verse that I think should characterize the evangelical church from Ephesians chapter 2. It says this, do nothing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. If the church in the United States and in the world had that as its living and breathing motivation for how we interact as parents, as employees, as doctors, as police officers, if we had that as our motivation, think how we could radically change the world around us. Think how different the world would look if the church was doing the, these verses right here. And it goes on to give us the perfect example in verse 5. 
have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, through, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. And the actual language there is he made himself nothing by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Midtown Church, we have to be wise, we have to be discerning as the world presents different ideas about what it means to live the good life. What we are called to be, like Jesus said to his disciples, is to be like a child. So as we engage with the world in humility, listen, listen. Try to understand where they're coming from. Don't automatically debunk theologically or philosophically. There may be a time for that. But listen and understand and point to Christ. Point to Jesus. Point to the truth of Scripture where it says all have sinned, all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. We all want better, and Jesus provides the better way. Pray for more childlikeness in the church. Let me pray. Father, we pray, I pray, Lord, that you would help us as a church, Midtown Church, for as long as we exist in this city, in this place, and I pray that it would be long until you return. Lord, that we would be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. As culture changes, Lord, we would be held fast by your word in humility and the fear of you, not in fear of man, not in fear of the world or fear of being canceled but only in fear of you, our gracious, merciful God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I understand a lot of questions maybe, so I want to encourage you, like if you have questions about these things, please, can only cover so much information here. Uh, do. I'd love to grab coffee and, uh, or lunch and uh, my treat and, and talk more about it. So please reach out if you would be so willing to do that. But would you stand and we'll receive communion. While the worship team comes up, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a cup, or he took bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took a cup and he said, this is my blood, shed for your sins. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you. Uh, for the way that you emptied yourself. You became nothing in order that we uh, could be significant before the Father's throne, in order that we could uh, be known and welcomed and received uh, by the Father because of your righteousness, not ours. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you, if you are uh, one who believes in Jesus as your Savior, died and rose again on your behalf, then this is a meal that is meant for you. If that's not what you believe, we're honored that you would come, um, but we ask you not to partake uh, in this meal. Um, we have uh, wine in the cups over here. Underneath is a little bread wafer.